Hello, my name is Dr. Virginia Von Schaefer, and today I would like to talk to you about the issues surrounding chemotherapy and cancer treatment. As an integrative oncologist, I have many patients asking questions about chemotherapy or coming to me and saying, I've had chemotherapy, it's terrible, I don't ever want to do it again, or I don't want to do any chemotherapy, I only want to do natural things, let me get rid of this big cancer in a natural way. So I want to talk about what the uses are for chemotherapy, what it's good for, what it does, what it doesn't do, and the different types of chemotherapy that can be offered to you as a patient uh, when you're uh, interfacing with your traditional oncologist or any other doctor or naturopath or um, another integrative oncologist. So first of all, the principle of chemotherapy is cancer cells are dividing at a very rapid rate orders of magnitude faster than a normal cell. So in the normal cell population, there's programmed death, and cells are supposed to live anywhere between five and 120 days. And it's, there are mechanisms, uh, cellular mechanisms, that will uh, tail the cell when it's time to die because it's lived its lifespan. And of course, there's different uh, lifespans for different cell types and different organs, so some cells in your stomach only live two, three hours. Some Your red blood cells are the longest living for 120 days. So there's a natural sequence of, of birth, if you will, living a life, and then dying and being replaced in your cells. So this goes on all the time, and basically in 120 days, all the cells that are in your body, 120 days from now, what I'm sitting here with, will only be residual some brain and lung bone cells, and everything else will be renewed. So it's a metabolic demand, it's, it's a miracle, and it's ongoing all the time. Now, when we get the case of a cancer, and patients battling uh, rapidly dividing cells, you know, cancer cells are just normal cells that kind of went wrong, and they're dividing rapidly, they're ignoring communication with other cells, they're not obeying the architecture of the organ that they originated from, and they can kind of break off from the tumor and go other places and set up shop and make another tumor, or what they call a metastatic lesion, other places in your body. So these cells, we look at and we say, if everything is growing rapidly and metastases are uh, forming, one of the techniques to treat is to stop that rapid di division. Now, Traditionally, that's what chemotherapy is used for. It's, a, it's basically cell toxins that poison various phases of cell division and stop it in, in its tracks. So chemotherapy is good for killing rapidly dividing cells. However, it's nonspecific. So if you have a rapidly dividing cell in the stomach, okay, it's going to get negatively affected as well. And this is why when people get uh, high-dose chemotherapy, uh, they have so many problems with the GI tract and digestion for long periods of time, as well as suppression of their bone marrow and production of new cells. So chemotherapy can be useful. However, the problem in traditional thinking is in part a failure to appreciate the entire problem as a microscopic issue. People think that if you have a big tumor mass and you can't cut it out, give a person a lot of chemotherapy, shrink that tumor mass down, then maybe cut it out, maybe do some radiation, and you'll be okay. And, you know, I, there's many, many patients who can attest to the fact that this doesn't work. Why? Because you haven't treated the microenvironment, you haven't treated why the patient got the cancer to begin with, and you haven't taken into account that cancer cells develop mechanisms to extrude chemotherapy as soon as it gets in the cell. And this is what they call resistance factors. And there are a number of cellular mechanisms, eight or 10, that have been identified very clearly uh, with a certain receptor on the surface of the cell, uh, the cancer cell. And those things can be counteracted. But when you're looking at a, traditionally, uh, a, a tr traditional approach to chemotherapy, it's high dose. Okay, and I'll give you an example. There are drugs that we use in our country that are literally outlawed in other countries. One of them is 5-fluorouracil. 
Now, this drug, when it's given for colon cancer, commonly is given in a milligram per kilogram body weight dosing. And so a tiny person can end up with four to five or 6,000 milligrams of this drug in a single dose in their chemotherapeutic regimen. They call it Folfox or Fox Fury or whatever. There's varying combinations. But this is a huge dose of toxin and poison. And it's kind of, if you think about it, intuitively obvious that if you don't address uh, resistance factors and other cellular me mechanisms, if you don't treat the body and microenvironment, yes, you're gonna have to use a ton of poison. and and just to get any effect at all. But you're gonna be so non-selective and give great toxicity to the entire person, the whole organism. And many of these drugs, especially 5-FU, is very, very neurotoxic. And some of these things are not reversible. So, and, and of course, in fact, they can be lethal. There's many people who get one dose of this regimen and they die. So the population being a little more savvy these days and questioning whether or not this is something that they want to subject themselves to are looking for other options. And so this is where uh, we come into these uh, other ways of administering chemotherapy. Assuming that chemotherapy is still going to be part of a treatment plan, some traditional oncologists have gone to utilizing what they call metronomic chemotherapy. So traditionally, chemo agents are dosed, as I say, milligram per kilogram per body weight in so many days. Like cisplatinum, you can only have so many milligrams per uh, body surface area in 30 days. But instead of giving it all in one dose and then four or five days and then waiting until the 28th day and then starting all over again, some people will divide up that monthly do dose and put it, give you once a week. Okay, it's not the different dose, it's still the dose that we would have gotten, but instead of getting it all in once, you're going to get it in sequ sequence in over a three, four week period of time. <clears throat> well, this is, can be more tolerable, it can be okay, it's still nonspecific, and you're still not treating all the other micro bio biological issues or tumor environment issues that might be present, and if we boosted the patient's immune system and did other things, they might have a better result. Either one of these first two methods is not treating the immune system and respecting the fact that people get cancer because their immune system is not functioning properly. And when you kill a bunch of cells, when you're using full-dose chemotherapy, what happens to those dead cells? Your immune system has to clean them up. That's the cleanup crew. So if your immune system is already impaired and weakened and maybe doesn't have enough resources to even fight the cancer, what do you think is going to happen when you give them the immune system a, just a kind of truckload of dead cells to clean up and deal with? It's going to be further taxed and further impaired. So this, although the technique itself can be useful, it's somewhat flawed in the way it's currently used in a traditional sense. Now this has caused uh, integrative oncologists to say, um, well, what can we do better? How can we make the drugs go into the cells better? How can we use less drug safely? What can we do? So commonly, the next step uh, in the evolution of this process was using what they call insulin potentiated chemotherapy. And there are many people who kind of pioneered this a number of years ago and it's still commonly used by integrative oncologists across the country and really in the world. Basically, the principle is take a tiny amount of the drug that you normally would use and potentiate its function by adding insulin in with the chemotherapy to drive it into, open the gates as it were, because cancer cells love sugar. So if you give insulin, it lowers the circulating blood glucose and the glucose doors open and kind of the theory is as the doors are open <laughs> shove the chemotherapy in there uh, driving it with dmso uh, or that's a solvent a dimethyl sulfoxide it's excellent to do that and it will help and so you can use a smaller dose of drug drive it into the cell more effectively and kind of keep it in the cell by lowering the blood sugar level of the patient during the entire administration 
There are many ways to do this, and the sort of traditional way is a IV push method, where they take a bunch of syringes and line them up, and you know, first you get the insulin, and then you get the DMSO, and then they check to see lowering the blood sugar level from a normal level, could be 70, 80, whatever, down to about 40 or 35, and then boom, 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 push the drugs in, <clears throat> and then raise the blood sugar level back up. And many people have uh, clinics where they'll uh, purport to say you're going you're gonna to have a very effective cancer treatment. I'm going to give you this insulin potentiated chemotherapy two, three times a week, and we're going to, you know, knock that cancer out. Well, yes and no. It is a better technique. However, it still doesn't address what's going on in the immune system. And when you use these low dose sessions, multiple ones in a week, you can stress the bone marrow. And of course, one of the number one and number two things that can happen is your white count goes down and you lose your uh, infection fighting cells, the neutrophils. And then the other thing is the platelets go down. So, you know, yes, you're killing cancer cells, but you're still impairing the whole system and threatening it because a low white count and low infection fighting cells can cause you be, to be susceptible to even a small infection and patients can get bone marrow failure and uh, neutropenic sepsis and even die. So that's a little bit problematic still in and of itself. When I looked at this situation myself, I before I started administering low-dose chemotherapy, I studied other people's results in the big clinic that I worked in. And I noticed, you know, that, that method wasn't working so great. You know, people were still getting recurrences and maybe the tumors would shrink, but you know, four or five months, sometimes two, three months later, they'd be all back. And you know, I've seen that in traditional chemotherapy too. So I feel like maybe we're not really fully addressing all the issues that we need to here. This is why I decide, decided to devise a, a different technique and I call it Adaptive Immune Potentiated Chemotherapy, AIPC. And what we do basically is limit the dosing of the low-dose chemotherapy that's potentiated with insulin and DMSO to only once a week. And I found people say, oh, I want it two or three times a week. It's not going to work well because this is a powerful treatment with just a tiny bit of toxic drug. When you compensate for the... Uh, uh, resistance factors, the cellular ones that we know of that are easy to take care of with uh, diflucan and quercetin and other elements, and then give just a single dose a week, and then surround that with immune boosting treatments, we get an amazing result by comparison. So I feel like boosting the immune system instead of crushing it repeatedly is a much more logical approach in my thinking and it's more physiologic people do better they tolerate it better they don't need so much chemotherapy and they get a, can get a phenomenal result and especially when you combine it with some of the other natural agents that are designed to not only boost the immune system but destroy the cancer cells uh, simple uh, glycolysis metabolism uh, which is making energy with a, without oxidation no mitochondria just a very simple but inefficient system, if you can paralyze that, you can really gain a lot of mileage in eliminating cancer cells beautifully. So it's, it's a matter of kind of looking at the situation, what, what are the issues, and then what do we have available to us to solve them? And I've come to realize that this is an excellent way to do it. Now, I can give a patient chemotherapy and low-dose chemotherapy in a minimal number of sessions, um, and, and stop that rapid replication, but then do other things to boost the immune system and find other methods to, methods to paralyze the energy making of the cancer cells so that the person doesn't have to be on chemotherapy for the rest of their life. I mean, when I was taught the low-dose chemotherapy regimens, it was basically you do IPT for two times a week for four weeks, then you do it one time a week for four weeks, and then you do it one time um, every two weeks, then you do it once a month. And maybe once a month for a year. Okay, nobody wants to be on chemotherapy for years. It just, it's very hard on your body. I don't care if it's low dose or whatever. It's just, it's intolerable. It's not a good lifestyle. 
and it's not really solving the problem. I've still seen people get recurrences either rapid or longer past the final dose of the chemo. And so it's really, really not effective. I much prefer boosting the immune system, using other metabolic tricks to support the killing, as it were, and um, minimize the use of chemotherapy. So those are the issues that I discuss with my patients when they come to me, because obviously many people don't want chemotherapy. They know it's dangerous. They've seen their friends die from it, or people you know, had a few doses of chemotherapy and it, it didn't work, or even in the case of one of my own relatives who chose to have a traditional chemotherapy treatment of her condition, and there's a spectrum population of cancer cells. So there's not all cancer cells metabolize the same way. There are low energy needing cancer cells that are in the greater portion of the population. And then, and they're usually more susceptible to the chemotherapy. And then there's a small portion that's really resistant to all chemo agents. And it's there all the time. It's not as though you had chemo and then the chemo made you get a resistant strain. No, they, they were always there. They're always there, and we see this in the RGCC testing. 20% of cells never respond to anything. So if you kill too many cells all at once, you destroy that kind of Darwinian selection process that's going on in this population of all these different kinds of cancer cells, and you destroy that balance. And if you kill all the ones that are lean, need less energy and leave the mutants, yeah, you're gonna have a huge problem. It's gonna come back with a vengeance, and it will be chemo-resistant, and you'll be sitting there wondering, you know, what am I going to do now? So a little killing at a time is excellent. Too much killing is too much of a burden on the immune system. And it also destroys that population balance of cancer cells. So we have to get at all these cancer cells from many different angles. And of course, mutants can be, you know, very distinctly disturbed by many different treatments, including all the metabolic, uh, you know, glucose depriving uh, treatments that we have available that don't involve chemotherapy. So I've just tried to present to you that it's a little bit of a complex matter. It's very manageable, but you have to use a better strategy if you want a good long-term result. And this is what I try and achieve for all of my patients because that's the goal. You know, anybody can make tumor balls go away, but they come back. So our goal is make it go away and make it stay away long-term. Thank you for listening to my talk, and I appreciate your attention, and I hope if there are some of you out there that need help, you'll come to me. I'm very happy to strategize for your success.